So tugs endoscopy is one of the chapters of tugs, and it has been started with the aim of promoting GI endoscopy among surgeons, specifically focusing on endoscopic procedures in the management of surgical diseases and creating a platform for learning GI endoscopy. So basically, it is all about endoscopy for the surgeons and by the surgeons. Now today for our second academic session, we are honored to have a group of erudite and accomplished speakers and panelists, which includes both surgeons and gastroenterologists. So as usual, we'll be having three talks today and they will be followed by a Q&A session and panel discussion. So I request all the attendees to please type your questions in the chat box and I and my co-hosts will put forward all your questions and queries to the speakers and panelists. So now I would request my co-moderator, Dr. Mosania, to introduce our panelist for the today's session. Dr. Mosania, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bavlin. Uh, a very warm good evening, good morning to all our esteemed um, to this webinar. My name is Dr. Ariza Moss. I am calling from Nigeria. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers and our panel. So the first speaker is Dr. Ratsod, who is the director and chief neurologist at the WGI Mumbai and founder and director of Endoscopy Asia. He is the past president of the Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy of he has trained hundreds of surgeons and gastroenterologists in advanced endoscopy and endoscopic ultrasound. Today, he will be talking to us about endoscopic of upper gastrointestinal emergencies. Our second speaker, Dr. Olusegun Komalafe, who is a consultant in general and colorectal surgery at the General Hospital, Glasgow. As part of his colorectal practice, Dr has a vast experience in colonoscopy and management of lower GI diseases. Today, he's going to speak on the role of endoscopy in the management of GI emergencies. Our top speaker is Dr. Shubash Kana, and he's a former professor of surgery at Gawahati Medical College and founder and director of Swaga Super Specialist Hospital. He has more than 100 publications and presentation to his credits and is the former vice president of the Laparoscopic Surgical Society and Henia Society of India and president of India Association of Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons. He is also of flexible endoscopy section of the Journal of Minimal Access Surgery, recent advances in minimal access surgery. Today he is going to speak on the role of GI in the management of intercultural emergencies. Our panelists include Omar Kunal, who is a professor of surgery at Mamara University in Istanbul, and is also associated with the Ministry of Health Pending Training and Research Hospital and Surgery Clinic. Also in the panel is Dr. Atul Sakdev, who is a meteorologist from India with over 35 years of experience. He is former director of Government Medical College, Chadiga, and is currently the director of Gastroenterology Max Super Specialist Hospital, Mohali, India. While the last, but not certainly not the least, is Dr. Sati, Satya Priya, and is a senior GI surgeon at Nightingale Hospital, Kolkata. Is honorary treasurer of the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endoscopic and is actively involved in all the GI endoscopy training programs conducted under the aegis of IAGES. Gentlemen and ladies, I'd like to welcome you to the second talks endoscopic webinar. And I'd like to now pass the talk back to Dr. Bavnit to help guide us through. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Mosanya. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's time for the first talk. May I please welcome Dr. Vipul Roy Rathod for his talk on the endoscopic management of upper GI endosco uh, emergencies. Dr. Vipul Roy, the screen is yours. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, good afternoon good morning good evening uh, colleagues and friends and and uh, uh, teachers seniors and juniors from across the world uh, dr bhavnit ji thank you very much and the tugs group to have uh, given this uh, great honor for me to come on board uh, and give my view on what can we do for upper gi emergencies now i do not know the cross section of the audience today but uh, what i am going to do today is i am going to take you through a case based uh, sort of a video digest as to <clears throat> what are the pathologies which we encounter in our day to day practice <clears throat> and over the last two decades there are so many cases which we have seen though my main area of thrust area is complex pancreatobiliary interventions and and more advanced uh, endoscopy guided okay. interventions so i'll limit my talk to case based video presentations i'll discuss few things i'm not going to mention any statistics or studies published we, we can always google it and see it but i think this is a personal experience which i would like to share with all of you today so most welcome all of you and hope to see you all soon in person also in near future so coming to the disclaimer i have none uh the whole objective of this particular presentation is what are the upper gi pathologies that can present as emergencies how is the primary management taken care of and then available of endoscopic evaluations <clears throat> and interventions required and what is the safety and efficacy of endoscopy what are the probable complication and what to look for when you have to uh, decide whether we need to stop here and let our surgical colleague take over if you are not doing surgery yourself so this is a very important uh, uh, understanding that you need to have when you deal with any uh, gi emergencies and i'm going to give this perspective from a surgeon's point of view uh, as we have a little different uh, orientation to anatomy and uh, more three dimensional uh, approach to anatomy because of handling of uh, you know anatomy during our surgical training and therefore i'm going to share that with all of you today so coming to a traditional approach for any gi or pancreatobiliary problems in our clinical practice is that we always have the basic investigations the biochemistry the radiological imaging and i think part of that holds true for even gi emergencies when a patient is uh, brought to a casualty or to a, a, an opd or a hospital directly with some emergency situation so we need to keep this in mind very very important now just to give you a little idea of how endoscopy has evolved over the last 6 7 decades and the most significant uh, if you ask me landmark was 1957 when professor basil hershowitz uh, brought about change of flexible endoscopy concept and over the period of time as you can see the evolutionary process of endoscopy we have gone through a metamorphosis of technology techniques and a lot of other available accessories to us so this has brought us to a a a, a, a meeting like tugs which is dedicated for endoscopy for surgeons and i think is very very important work tugs is doing we really appreciate the entire team's effort so this is the professor uh, basil hershowitz i was very very fortunate uh, to be in company of basil hershowitz long time ago when i was uh, part of the alabama uh, there was a small series and uh, he was a professor emeritus at uh, alabama university and i feel that because of the pioneers like this we are talking about a subject so it is extremely important for us to remember these pioneers who have contributed a great deal in our science i will never start my talk my scientific deliberation without thanking my mentors and here i would like to mention my mentor dr kenneth bin moller who was the deputy of professor nip sohendra i was very fortunate to be in germany in hamburg university hospital long long time ago for almost a year and a half and that's where i had my uh, fundamental training of complex pancreatobiliary endoscopy and endosonography way back in 95 96 and then we started the ball rolling in this country so it's my uh, humble uh, gratitude to my mentors 
coming to why surgeons should be talking about endoscopy. And these are some of the landmark surgical uh, colleagues who have made contributions in the field of flexible endoscopy. And we must acknowledge that as well. Say, for instance, Professor Nip Sohendra, I remember when I was in Germany and he talked about uh, the first glue injection, which he did way back in 1985, and which has really changed the management of uh, acute variceal GI bleed for vast majority of nations, except few countries, probably they also have now inducted in their FDA policies. But what I'm saying is one technique which has brought about a revolutionary uh, outcome changes for mankind. So I think this is very, very important. Uh, my friend Peter Willman from Copenhagen was the first man to do EUS FNA. And of course, Dr. Ponsky and Haru and G.V. Rao and so many other surgeons who have really brought about a massive change in our practice because of their valued contribution in the field of flexible endoscopy. Uh, I would not uh, forget to mention uh, Sidney Chung, uh, a, a dear friend, but he, he migrated a long time ago from Hong Kong but he was probably one of the pioneers in non variceal GI bleed. We all know about, he also, also as a surgeon. Coming from there, what are the uh, pathologies which can lead to GI emergencies? That will be foreign bodies, we'll have GI luminal strictures, we have massive upper GI bleed, maybe acute dysphagia, corrosive injuries, maybe patients with spontaneous fistula formation, and of course, spontaneous, spontaneous and iatrogenic perforations. And this could be secondary to uh, spontaneous perforation like Boerhaav syndrome, or patients will have uh, some diverticular perforation in esophageal, or patient will have a, a spontaneous uh, perforation in the stomach also, where we have seen with gastric volvulus and other things. But we have seen iatrogenic perforations also in and that can also be managed endoscopically at the same time. So this is a list of things. I'm not much for the text and a lot of theory. So we will go straight to uh, what are the things which we can do. So we started treating bleeding lesions, foreign bodies, and we can have strictures, we can have diverticular disease, we can manage with endoscopy, perforation closures, we have clips, sutures, staples, and this all that brought about in the era of therapeutic endoscopy, which started in mid seventies. So any clinical setting will be uh, important to have a very detailed clinical history and examination of the patient. Uh, the casualty room measures have to be met, uh, depending what where you're doing an OPD setting or hospitalization in, on indication but make sure the patient's vitals are stable. These are fundamental pre key principles for surgery, surgical principles, which we all follow for even surgical emergencies. Uh, I personally feel patient with some GI, upper GI emergencies like GI bleed should have, or perforation should have ICU backup. Uh, of course, the communication with the patient and the relative is extremely vital if you want to deal with any emergency situation in patients because we are not very clear or sure about the outcome depending on the magnitude of complication or emergency. We should have emergency imaging techniques available and of course, emergency endoscopy intervention at the middle of the night and 24 hours. And of course, most important, a surgical team standby should be there always. And this is something which is the basic uh, requirement for you to do any uh, intervention. What are the equipment you need as an endoscopist? You need high resolution diagnostic and therapeutic scopes. Probably you also need a double channel therapeutic gastroscope for very massive bleeds. You need high resolution fluoroscopy in some cases. Well-trained endoscopy assistant is a must. Then we have needles, snares, foreign body forceps, rubber hood, loops, clips. We have guide wires, we have dilators, we have needle knife, we have probes of unipolar, bipolar probes. We have electrosurgical unit, APC is important. And of course, some cases where you use stents. Now, which are the stents which I use? Very rarely, of course, we use stents in intractable GI bleed, variceal GI bleed, where you put a stent uh, for a temporary purpose, but that's never required if you do a proper therapeutic intervention. And of course, experienced anesthetist, depending on the age of the patient, including pediatric anesthesiologist. And of course, top of the line, of course, endoscopies, who has to be experienced in this area. 
So what really changed for all of us? The magnification endoscopy. Now I'm just going to tell you the reason why magnification endoscopy is important is that it allows you to pick up smallest possible bleeding lesion in, 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 in a hidden area of complex situation. Now, this is not a case of a GI bleed, but this is a case of a very bad GERD with nodular changes and in Barrett's and all kinds of things. But I'm just giving a representation of how digital chromoendoscopy and magnification endoscopy will assist us greatly in diagnosis of certain problems. I don't know how many of you have seen acute necrotizing esophagitis. I saw this patient sometime, long time ago, a young lady, a 28-year-old lady with anemia and her entire esophagus was necrosed. You can see that. And the disease extended in the stomach as well. She came with severe absolute dysphagia and anemia. And then, of course, we did not know what to do. We do, did some biopsies. The, because of necrotic material, the histology was very, very uh, limited information. Uh, we took some fungal cultures. There was some candida growth. And what we did was, I'll tell you what the therapeutic intervention we did. This is a follow-up. Are you seeing the follow-up video of this lady after the treatment? This is after uh, 10 days of treatment. So what we did was we placed a feeding tube, a gast nasogastric feeding tube. We give her antibiotics, antifungal agents give her IV support and some nutrition. And after a few weeks, we went inside and we found this particular problem. I've never seen a severely necrotizing esophagitis. I'm just going to show you one more time how bad it was that I was scared to even push my scope down, that you would perforate straight into the mediastinum here. So these are the kinds of very rare cases you come across as GI emergency in the upper GI tract. Coming to foreign bodies, as all we all know, this was an elderly gentleman, almost four by three centimeter size of denture with very sharp edges. And these are the kind of emergencies which we come across as, as endoscopies. And you can see a black hood, a rubber hood, which has been put on my tip of the scope. And we will uh, retract this foreign body, the sharp edges into the hood. So it does not lacerate the esophageal mucosa. Now two areas, there is a laceration possible, the G junction at the upper esophageal sphincter area. So after the removal of the uh, foreign body, we always make sure that we evaluate the, the GI tract for any, any injury, mucosal injury or any uh, problems. So it's very, very important. So what I'm trying to say, appropriate use of accessory will improve efficiency and safety. Use of hood will prevent problems in sharp foreign body objects. Coming to some rare uh, complications like fish bones. Now, Patients with uh, fishbone emergencies, uh, you have to be very, very careful. I remember discussing a case with one of the colleagues where they had mentioned to me that there was a fishbone which has penetrated from the esophagus into the aorta. And when they tried to remove that foreign body, the patient collapsed on the table with a massive aortic dissection. So you have to be extremely be careful when you deal with a foreign body in the esophagus. And this is one such foreign body like a bone, a fish bone, a very fine fish bone, which has gone across the esophagus. So extremely carefully, you have to hold the fish bone, pull it out in, in, in its in it perpendicular axis, and then very gently, you roll it out. And under proper full vision, you have to do these procedures in, uh, in uh, this kind of a situation. So here you can see here, what I'm doing, I'm going to the opposite side of the wall, and then we managed to straighten the foreign body and under vision, a complete under vision, we were able to take out this sharp foreign body very, very uh, safely without any problems. Coming to young children, now endoscopy in very, very young babies like this two month old baby is always done of a small button cell you can see here in the throat on x-ray. And uh, this is something which you need to be very, very careful any foreign body such as battery or button cell should be addressed within the first 24 hours or within 12 hours of ingestion. This is my recommendation. And I'm sure a lot of you will agree who do endoscopy for foreign bodies. And this child, fortunately, we were able to disengage this button cell and we were able to salvage a major esophageal complication, though it, the child came after almost a one week. So what I'm trying to say, you need a whole team approach with a pediatric anesthesiologist.
coming to <coughs> acute dysphagia because of history of dyspepsia. Now you can see this is in a patient who can't even swallow a drop of water. Can you see there is a foreign body here in a peptic stricture? So there is a grade four uh, reflux esophagite with peptic stricture. So what I'm doing, I'm putting a dormia basket across and there was a, probably some sort of a, a grain or a ball, which was a football, which got impacted. And immediately then we will, when we do, when we do not know the extent of the stricture, we always do uh, dilatation over a Savarigillard dilator and not a balloon dilator. So guys, whoever is uh, trying to learn dilatation, uh, we have had the opportunity to dilate more than 3,500 esophageal strictures. Huh? So I can tell you that the safest way when you are not sure of what is beyond that stricture, always do a savory dilator under over a guide wire and of course with a fluoroscopy. But once you have enough experience, you can dilate without a fluoroscopy as well. So these are some of the GI emergencies which we deal with in our day-to-day -day practice. So again, a patient with dyspepsia who had uh, intermittent dysphagia and you can see a pinhole narrowing in the lower end of the esophagus. So we always put a guide wire first under endoscopy vision and 95% of our patients, we do not need any fluoroscopy uh, guidance for dilatation. And we always use, uh, we know it's a smooth stricture. Patient had history of GERD, so we dilated. And as you can see, after balloon dilatation, you can walk. So the first investigation, as I understand, for any dysphagia patient should be endoscopy. I have not used barium study. I'm sorry, but I may be unconventional in my approach, but I have not used barium study in my work over the last so many 25 years for dysphagia. I have not used, of course, sometimes for achalasia, we may use it. Coming to young children, when they have been operated for a esophageal atresia, and there is, a, there is an anastomotic stricture, these are the kind of patients where you can manage with endoscopic treatment. So even young children can be managed with this kind of techniques. I'm gonna skip some slide, but I want to show you there are patients who come with dysphagia to us with a large mediastinal mass. And why I'm sharing with you this video is for all of you to understand that your reach as an endoscopy can be beyond the esophagus. And this is where a large mediastinal lymph nodes are impinging on the esophageal wall and causing dysphagia. This patient, we did EUS guided biopsy and it turned out to be, I was very fortunate to start EUS in this country and the first FNA perhaps of Asia and Middle East whole of Africa and Southern Hemisphere happened in 1999. So we are very fortunate to pioneer this technique since last 23 years. And you can see this is how easy we can take a biopsy. So patients with uh, mucosal problem and beyond mucosa can also be addressed by an endoscopist. Uh, I'm gonna skip this slide. I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip this also. I'm gonna skip also this one, but I'm gonna show you the management of GI bleed, especially the varicell GI bleed, we all know has been revolutionized. And I will show you how acute GI bleed is managed. This is a case where uh, this was a balloon dilatation, but this was a one-year-old child. Extra hepatic, portovenous obstruction with a large cavernoma. And this child had an active GI bleed from the junctional varix, you can see here. Active GI bleed in a young one-year-old baby. Now, Professor Nip Sohendra taught us very well how to do glue injection right intravericial and that stops the bleeding instantaneously. Then therefore I've never used a Sengstecken Blackmore tube in the last 25 years of my practice. I've never used a stent for varicell bleed non-control. Uh, so if you do a right technique, you can stop the bleeding immediately. Uh, we have even stopped acute varicell bleed even just with band ligation. You don't really need. Now, I just want to highlight even one-year-old child, you can do band ligation. Huh? You have to be extremely careful in when you do a, a young baby uh, with band ligation. So this is a comprehensive management for varicial GI bleed. Coming to non-varicial GI bleed, uh, I want to highlight to all of you that it's always important to wash a clot. So whenever there is an adherent clot, I don't want to go into the detail of forest classifications, but always remember when you see a non-varicial upper GI bleed, and if you see a clot, you better dislodge that clot because that will damn thing will bleed again within 24 to 48 or 70 hours, 72 hours. 
So there are te techniques which we use. We are like a tamponades. Here I'm using injection all around the ulcer base and we give a tamponade with saline adrenaline. And then of course, we will burn the center of it. Similarly, there are combination of techniques which you can use for upper GI, non varicial GI bleed. Maybe you can have argon plasma coagulation, we can have monopore or bipore coagulation, and we can also have uh, sometimes, uh, I'll just show you some more case. Now, say for instance, actively bleeding ulcer, very, very florid ulcer bleed, you have to be extremely careful because you need to know when to stop and when to get your surgeon on board. And this is extremely important. Now you can see a posterior wall ulcer at the junction is actively spurting. And these are difficult areas to manage. So you need to have large channel scopes, therapeutic channel scopes. Sometimes you need double channel scopes we use in our practice. And because it's a very dedicated endoscopy unit we have, so we have to have all the armamentarium. So we are doing bipolar. So whenever I have a very deep ulcer, I prefer to use a bipolar. If that does not work for some reason, then we use a more unimonopolar. Very rarely we use clips for fibrotic ulcer bases. Very rarely I use. And most important, now newer clips like Ovesco will help us to overcome such bleeds in more aggressive manner. So see, I'm trying to do with bipolar is not stopping. So what we are going to do now, we are going to use monopolar current and we are going to burn the whole thing and the bleeding will instantaneously stop. So it's extremely important that you use all kinds of techniques and uh, armamentarium you have in your disposal. I'm going to skip this slide also for the paucity of time, but I'm going to show you why high resolution endoscopy and a careful observation is needed. This patient had multiple endoscopies and anemia and hematemesis history. And I want all of you to see what we found on narrowband imaging, we saw submucosal vessel. So what I did after evaluating and ruling out all the GI problems, what we did, we went ahead and we tried to burn the surface, the mucosa part, and we exposed the subepithelial vessel. See, this is a classical dulafoy, huh? a classical dulafoy. Now, I personally, my experience of over 100,000 endoscopic procedures, that clipping is the best solution for dulafoy. Even though it is in the fundus, I had to retroflex but it is possible to do that. So hemoclip application is very good for dulafoil lesion. So this is something which I wanted to share with all of you. Now, what is going to change? Aggressive management of perforations, suturing, various types of clipping device, and of course, staplers. So we have Ovesco clip, which allows me to do full thickness resections and large bleeders and large perforations to be close up to up to 1.5 to 2 centimeters. It's not beyond, it's beyond the scope of my talk and the time today. So ladies and gentlemen, I will not take much time, but these are some of the platforms which are developing for more aggressive intervention for upper GI. So if you ask me, what is my observation and recommendation? There's a vast majority of upper GI emergencies cases can be diagnosed or treated at the same time, vast majority. You have to make sure right indication, right equipment infrastructure with properly trained endoscopy team besides the outcomes. Hospitals should be equipped with ICU blood bank and trained uh, surgical backup team. Advent of newer endoscopy accessories and platforms will enable our uh, abilities to even tackle very complex complications like perforations. And I feel that all GI emergencies, I think, is a multidisciplinary team approach where you have to take help of your other colleagues <laughs> to help you to solve the case. With that, I would like to thank all of you for your patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vipal Roy, for that very comprehensive and informative uh, and very interesting talk. Uh, how nice to Como Lafay for his talk, and he'll be talking about the endoscopic management of lower GI <clears throat> emergencies. Dr. Como Lafay, the screen is yours. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we do. Let Please me go ahead. and get my presentation going. Hello. Is that working okay? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, so. 
Uh, similar to our previous talk, are we? This is going to be a whistle stop tour, tour of a very um, uh, wide ranging topic. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for Dr. Mossinger for the invitation. Um, uh, this is where I work, uh, based in Wishaw. Wishaw is a small town which is just southwest of Glasgow, so I live in Glasgow itself, and I am a university honorary lecturer. Uh, a bit of background, um, because there is a one of the problems with the endoscopic interventions for lower GI surgery is that, um, yeah, what you do is driven very much by uh, what's available and what you're good at and what facilities you have, as we've seen in the, in the previous slide. Uh, so I have two scope lists a week. I do bowel screening twice or thrice a month. I also perform a complex polyp MD, uh, complex polypectomies, EMRs, etc. Uh, and I also perform emergency upper GI endoscopy, although I have to confess I'm not as radical as our previous speaker with some of the things that he's doing. Uh, my limits are ulcers and the uh, viruses sometimes. Let me go on to the next slide. Uh, so I will also try and cover just the uh, four, so four main topics, uh, again, for the sake of time. And I will try and talk through some patients uh, and then make some general kind of comments and observations about them. We don't have the luxury of video endoscopy where I work um, in, in Wishaw. So I, I, all I have is still image to show you, but hopefully that will suffice. And essentially for obstruction management falls into two categories. Um, uh, for neoplastic obstruction, then you're looking at self-expanding metal stents. For benign obstruction or post-operative or inflammatory bowel disease obstruction, then uh, generally most of us tend to lean towards balloon dilatation rather than stenting. This is a gentleman who is 74 year old. Hope you can see the CT scan. This is a, uh, a coronal view of his abdomen. And you can see this lesion in his uh, descendant colon, which is uh, good for stenting because as it looks annular. It's nice and short. Um, what I haven't shown you in this um, image is that the actual sigmoid colon comes up and then goes down. So it's a wee, it was slightly awkward to get to colonoscopically, but we were able to get to it. And these are pictures of the lesion with the lumen. And we're able to feed a guide wire through it and then the dilator and then stent it with a good view of the lumen beyond the lesion uh, in the bottom right picture here. So fairly straightforward for stenting. And this is a picture of uh, the same pathology with uh, the, the stent inside you with nice wasting in the middle of the stent telling you that it's in the right place. Another patient with who had a self-expanded metal stent is a gentleman who had uh, what was thought to possibly be a T4 tumor of his transverse colon. The reason I'm showing you this particular one is that there can, some of the literature suggests that it can be more difficult to stent beyond the splenic flexure. But this is a gentleman who actually had a transverse colon tumor. There was a suggestion it was a T4 tumor. So our MDT decision was supposed to go on to have neoadjuvant chemotherapy at first, as per the Fall Fox trial, it's a uh, Fox trial, et cetera, and then um, come to have surgery. So he began to get his uh, chemotherapy, and then after his second cycle of chemo, presented obstructed with this image. So what you can see now is that the lesion is. Uh, tight and there is holdup of solid uh, matter um, and, and, and gas proximal to it on the coronal view. So he then underwent uh, again uh, stenting. Um, and this you can see is the guide wire inside you, stent inside you, and then a quick check at the end to make sure that everything was as it should be. So the main point to make about the stents is that uh, it should be a patient with definitive obstruction. You don't do stenting for prophylaxis. You don't do it if it's too soon, in quotes, because if, if you do the stenting too soon, the stent won't grip. The paradox is that the stent needs to be able to grip tissue that's tight for it to be effective. And uh, the evidence suggests that if you're bridging to surgery, you want to operate around two weeks uh, after your, um, your scope. Tenesmus isn't a major issue if you're more than five centimeters from the anal verge. There's no specific contraindication to lesions proximal to the splenic flexure. Uh, if you have the facility and the options and you can adjust the size of your stent, so a, so a 60 millimeter stent, for example, might suffice for a tight annular lesion, 
My own personal preference is the nine to one stents by and large, and that works in most situations. My also personal preference to use a through the scope stent uh, in combination with image intensifier and a fluoroscopy so that I can see as I'm deploying this stent where it's sitting. I don't use a guide wire and then blind deployment of stent, although some colleagues do that and have a result from that. And then the thing, the thing I would say is when you're deploying the stents, particularly to take, pay attention so you don't have proximal slippage of the stent. Dilatation. This is a Crohn's patient of mine who had had a previous uh, septocolectomy for Crohn's disease. She uh, had insisted and insisted that we re-anastomose her ileum to her rectal stump. So I did that after much discussion and unsurprisingly, she then developed uh, some ulceration and recurrence of her Crohn's at the ileal rectal anastomosis with some obstructive symptoms. So she then went on to have a dilatation. So you can see the lumen here. The balloon is through it, no problem. At the end of the procedure, I think I've, I've got a nice dilatation. And then I put the scope through the lumen and I see this. And of course, for every, every GI endoscopy, it's just, your heart sinks at this point because you're now performing a, 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 a endoscopic laparoscopy. So I immediately had to abort. And obviously, as, as a surgeon, I was able to sort the problem out. So the point I would say about the dilatation is it's not advisable in cancer strictures, and it's probably also not advisable in really bad ulceration from Crohn's, for example. There can be a, a tendency to fracture the tumor and to cause a perforation. Um, and that said, it can be useful in benign, in Crohn's, we've got a benign anastomotic stricture, but I would say if you have ulcerated nasty Crohn's, then be careful about stretching that up. Um, certainly in uh, anastomotic uh, burnt out Crohn's structures and you can avoid uh, surgery in some cases or certainly delay the need for surgery. Um, the thing to say about uh, stretching anastomosis is often you need to do a repeated stretch to get a stable stretch, to so stretch it three or four times over three or four or five weeks to make sure that it stays stretched and open because there's a natural tendency towards restenosis. And uh, as I demonstrated with the previous case, you must always have a clear plan for a complication or perforation before you start. Uh, really important because when you stretch anastomosis, stretch strictures, uh, unfortunately, a proportion will perforate. Uh, bleeding. The main thing to say about bleeding is that uh, the, the, the recent uh, guidelines published by the BSG, British Site of Gastroenterologist, um, based on a national audit of actual practice of uh, management of lower GI bleeding across uh, the UK. So off the back of the data trawl and the people's responses, they put together an audit with some guidelines. And it's very, it seems complicated at first, but it's actually very, very simple, which is that you simplify your GI bleeders into stable, on the right or unstable using the shock index. And the shock index very simply is the heart rate over the systolic blood pressure. So when you get that crossover where your heart rate is greater than your systolic blood pressure, then your shock, your shock index will be greater than one. And that patient should be treated as an unstable bleed and they should go on to have a CT angiogram. The people who will come to have GI endoscopy are those who are stable bleeders, those whose heart rate is greater than their systolic blood pressure. And then you can calculate the risk score. The author of this paper is a, a lady called Karen Oakland. And off the back of the data troll that she did, she put together uh, an Oakland score, which I'll show you in the next slide, to categorize patients into major or minor. So this is the Oakland score on the right. And it shows you, you look at age, gender, previous admission, rectal examination, heart rate, blood pressure, and hemoglobin. Hemoglobin means you have to do it within a hospital environment. It's not one for primary care. And so use your Oakland score. And if someone's Oakland score is greater than eight, then you need to treat as a major bleeder and they would recommend a scope soon. Uh, and also consider an upper GI bleed because as we all know, rapid transit upper GI bleeding can give you uh, rectal bleeding, okay? The, the interesting thing about the, the, the recommendations, although they recommend early lower GI endoscopy, they also admit that the data does demonstrate very clearly that this doesn't impact outcomes. All it does is you will find the bleeding lesion 
with more certainty if you scope sooner, but it won't affect outcomes because, as we all possibly know or should know, the vast majority of rectal bleeding or GI, lower GI bleeding is self-limiting and will stop by itself. Um, so the main area that I think that um, endoscopic intervention for lower GI bleeding has a place is iatrogenic lower GI bleeding. And I think if you've done enough lower GI interventions, all of us will have taken off the, the pedunculated polyp that you slice up and then starts to spurt, or you do an EMR and then the bed starts to ooze, for example, and it's the, or, uh, or you operate in somebody and you have a staple line bleed. And it's these kinds of people that you already know where the pathology is that you can manage, um, that you can manage endoscopically. And of course, as part of that, we, all, we will know, or we should know, that what you want to, you want to prevent rather than cure. So doing a polypectomy, I'll be aware of your energy setting. If you're taking off a, a thickened pedunculated polyp, make sure you diathermy across the stalk very carefully and very slowly and very precisely, because these are always fed by a single artery, almost always. Then a big EMR, make sure you can, you, the bed is dry at the end. One of the things that has caught me out recently, actually, and this has just been honest, is that I previously have used a green, GIA cartridge for ileocolic anastomosis, and I've had a couple of staple line bleeds in the past six months. I use a GI, I use a green cartridge because it's thicker and I think it's better, but the, the problem with the green cartridge is that the staples are further apart. And so I've had a couple of GI bleeds at staple line, and I think it's because I use the cartridges that are slightly bigger with bigger staple lines. We are patients in anticoagulation, uh, people in warfarin, antiplatelets, uh, rivaroxaban, these all these new expensive drugs. Uh, and the main things to remember here is we want to apply dual modality and endostasis similar to upper GI bleed. So uh, coagulation and a clip, for example, but you must also remember the colon is thinner, so it's more prone to perforation immediately or perforation from a diathermy burn. Um, my own personal preference for endostasis is a through the scope clip if possible because you can do that without having to bring a scope in and go back out and out and then going back in uh, through a therapeutic channel. Over the scope clips are very good because they can give you bigger purchase of tissue, but they require withdrawal and reintroduction, so it's a trade-off. An astomotic leak and endoscopic management thereof. Very big subject, very topical nowadays. Um, there was a, a, a mindset that the safest thing to do for an astomosis is get the patient off the table, uh, get them back to theater, take the anastomosis down, drain the sepsis, blah, blah, blah. But we now know that the morbidity from this second laparotomy or laparoscopy is actually not insignificant. And a large proportion of these patients will never get the stomas reversed. So over the past five or so, maybe five, seven, eight years, there has been a gradual move towards intervening to salvage anastomosis. This is one of my patients. Um, I wanna say it's my last anastomotic leak. I could be wrong. Uh, she had a robotic uh, anterior resection in November last year. She's 79 year old, got home uh, day three, day four, no major issues. And then uh, we, we, with the ones that we get, we always see them back early. Uh, if they get home to check, there's no problems. So we brought her back and her main complaint was just a bowel habit was variable. She would have a few days of bowels working and a few days of bowel not working. She would have a few days of a temperature and then it would settle down, but she was home. She was generally well, she was eating and drinking. We got her a few scans and there was nothing definite on the scan. And so about a month after her operation with this kind of clinical picture, I eventually said, I need to try and have a look and see what's going on. I should add that I will do an on-table sigmoidoscopy for all my rectal anastomoses uh, after they're asked to check. I don't have that image because unfortunately that particular theta didn't have a, an endoscopy connection with the Unisoft, their recording system. So I, I don't have it for comparison. This is what I found in her um, when I scoped her a month after her operation. You can have a small defect in the anastomosis here. Uh, the, the lumen itself is okay, but there's a small pinhole. So what I did was I, re I took the scope out, put an over the scope clip back in, uh, sucked all the, uh, all the gunk, all the abscess cavity, it was a small cavity, sucked that out, and then applied an OTS clip over the defect. 
uh, and that worked very well. Give her antibiotics for another couple of days, and she was fine. And this is actually this, this is in the December when I scoped her. This is a scope that I did about a month ago, showing that um, the defect has healed up. She's been totally fine and has been okay without any issues with the TT lesion, so didn't, have, didn't require any more um, treatment. Um, this is an interesting paper um, where we are a, a bunch of surgeons. Surgeons, we as surgeons uh, tend to be really paranoid about leaks and we don't like leaks, so we don't need to look for them. These guys went to look for leaks for all their patients with a scope at week one and week four, and they aim to try and classify and describe. And what they basically demonstrated is that if you go looking for leaks, you can actually classify the leaks very, very well according to size and location. And then how you manage it depends on what you find. And their argument, their argument is that if you're more proactive in looking for leaks, you can mitigate problems and complications. This is a fantastic uh, paper, a systematic review of managing leaks endoscopically. Um, I'm happy to share the slides with uh, the, the coordinator so you can get the reference later if you want. Um, and what, they, what their review demonstrates or confirms is that uh, minimally invasive, which just salvaged anastomosis are successful and less morbid. Defunction anastomosis, if you have an anastomotic leak and you have to do a scope the patient, if you defunction that patient, then it can make it slightly easier to manage and there's a greater chance you'll reverse or re re revert that defunctioned anastomosis. Small defects can be clipped uh, with a drainage of a, a cavity or closed with fibrin glue, and large defects can be managed with negative pressure dressing, endosponge or back therapy, um, which reduces edema, promotes formation of uh, granulation, increases vascularity, reduces colonization very well. I'd, I'd hope to present a couple of pictures of some of my patients, but I couldn't, all the ones I have are from four or five years ago, and I couldn't get them organized in time for this. I have to apologize for that. Perforation, um, pathological perforations are usually not amenable to endoscopic management. That's a possibly a controversial thing to say, but generally if a perforated cancer or a diverticular disease or uh, Crohn's or whatever else, then because of, the associated, because of the pathology at the site of the perforation, any endoscopic attempt usually, usually won't work because you're not trying to manage healthy tissue, you're managing pathological tissue. However, Perforations that I cause or that we cause are the ones that you can sort out. The main thing to see is that early detection is crucial. Uh, through the scope, TTSC through the scope clips or over the scope clips are both successful, and as is fibrin blue. And for the sake of time, I won't kind of show you pictures of that, but I'm happy to take questions now or at the very end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Komalafe, for that wonderful talk. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but uh, right now we'll jump on to the third talk and we'll take all the questions together once the once Dr. Subhash Karna has uh, given his presentation. So now I invite Professor Subhash Karna and his talk is on the endoscopic management of hepatobiliary emergencies. Sir, the screen is yours. So please unmute yourself. Okay, am I audible? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tux. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bhalla, for that kind introduction. Uh, I am given the topic of uh, speaking on endoscopic hepatobiliary emergencies. I am Professor Subhash Khanna, a surgeon, a robotic surgeon, and my main interest is today a robotic and minimal access surgery, but uh, endoscopy has been a passion of mine. And since 1996, I'm doing uh, therapeutic uh, endoscopy, mostly ERCP. Uh, when I was giving this uh, topic, I, 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 I just uh, thought I would like to share uh, some, a small uh, quote by Emily Dickinson. A surgeon or an endoscopic must be careful when they take the knife. Underneath the knife, 
and the underneath the fine incision stirs the culprit the life. Uh, the topic is very wide. When we say emergency and hepatobiliary, I think uh, I don't need to enumerate all the conditions where an endoscopist is needed. What I want to say, starting from CBD stone to pancreatic leaks, to CBD strictures, to malignant strictures of CBD, to a CBD stone in a pregnant or a small child, to the parasitic diseases, to the idiopathic pancreatitis where there's no cause found to the malignancies, the, the pancreatic necrosis, the uh, hydrolysis of the liver and uh, endoscopic drainage of the pseudocyst. It's a very, very high subject. What uh, do I, what, what do we understand by this is endoscopy has taken a much inroads in surgery and many of the conditions have become amenable to endoscopy today. Uh, in the time permitted to me, let's say what uh, some of these, what we can take up for now. Uh, well, we uh, uh, once again, I'll start with a surgeon McCune, who in 1968 gave us the first uh, use of endoscopic uh, when he did cannulation of the ampulla of Vater. And thereafter, he was no looking back with more lot, lot of refinement in techniques, lot of uh, new accessories coming. Uh, we have come a long way today with the addition of uh, image enhancements, uh, what uh, Dr. Viparoy had shown, and with the additions of a uh, uh, lot many gadgets, we are ab able to uh, do much more advanced work. Uh, Dr. Viparoy Rathod has already said what I want to say, where I understand many general surgeons who are yet to start ERCP or therapy endoscopy must be watching here. So a quick uh, advice. If at what you want, at all you want to start therapeutic ERCP, and if at all you want to attend the emergencies, you should be ready with a complete OR, with an NSSI machine, a completely trained team, and also an anesthetist with you. Uh, you must have a uh, suit with wider doors so that any patient coming in can be trolled in. Uh, when we look at the major common malware, problems, we always have thought that common bile duct is a conduit. So when we talk about hepatobiliary and pancreatic problems, the so CBD comes first, and uh, CBD is not only a conduit between the liver and the uh, intestine, it is surrounded by uh, pancreas, it, is, it has so many organs around it, so the moment any other organ is affected, CBD is affected, whether it is the ampullary mass or uh, anything of that sort. Similarly, the common bile duct programs, uh, problems are also very complex. It is very difficult to dissect the CBD from starting from conventional surgery. We have moved to open and to uh, robotic surgery today. So CBD may be affected by congenital, traumatic, inflammatory, neoplastic, and obstructive lesion. And all of these cause different types of jaundice, different types of cholangitis, and different types of problems. And most of these are amenable to endoscopy. If I, Let's see one. Uh, when we're talking about uh, the ERCP and a patient in an obstructed jaundice, uh, we need to know a little, uh, little bit about uh, sphincterotomy, whether I should be doing a sphincterotomy or sphincteroplasty, whether I'll be using a balloon or a basket. Sphincterotomy was a standard of care, and even today it is popular, but no one wants to leave a permanently damaged sphincter. So, uh, so balloon sphincteroplasty has come a long way whether I should be uh, having a high risk of pancreatitis by using balloon, whether it is more bleeding with a balloon, uh, it is not. But then what is a strong indication, even if I don't want to use a balloon, when I should use a papillary balloon dilatation, at least in coagulopathy, in CLD, and in pediatric patient, when I don't want to cut a sphincter, I would love to use a balloon. Uh, when you want to start an emergency in the biliary tree, you must be prepared with all types of uh, uh, cannulas, both five French, ten French, because you do not know in which structure you might need a three, three French uh, tip, papillotomes, both rotatable. You must also be prepared with needle knife, with different types of guide wire, 0.035 or 0.025, dormia basket, CRE balloons, uh, and uh, on top of this, the <coughs> injection in one in 20,000, but the most important is uh, this instrument, uh, which I always say, keep one swindler detector with you. Whenever you are stuck with a basket, you might need to use this. Uh, 
Okay, so when we want to cannulate in an obstructed duct, we either use a standard technique where we uh, can go inside with a papular catheter or a papillotome. Today, the papillotome is more pop popular because in a papillotome having a, which has a tip of two or three centimeter, depending on what papillotome you are using, you can always bow it and give a direction to the tip. Needle knife pre-cut, I'll just show a video if time permits, is good when there is a stone impacted at the papilla uh, uh, and when you cannot pass uh, the, 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 the cannula or the sphincterotome or you cannot calculate, you can always prefer to go for paper pre-cut. Uh, but then if you have to understand what is pre-cut and what are the basic uh, guidelines for that. For that. Uh, pancreatic guidewire stent technique is also important in case you are going frequently into the PD, which is straight at uh, 12 o'clock or uh, at three o'clock, then you might have to sometimes put a guide well there so that you don't go in uh, hitting the PD time and again and then end up with pancreatitis. Uh, okay, uh, so most of the cases, the papilla uh, is very plain and simple. You can see here, although it is very simple, there's a small diverticulum nearby and diverticulum are always problematic. We have to understand if it is a papillary diverticulum or is a periampillary diverticulum. And uh, any endoscopist uh, has to understand the direction of, uh, of uh, his uh, uh, guide wire and his pinter of insertion. So just for the beginners, we always nowadays don't inject the contrast. We go in, we uh, both in the non-obstructed and obstructed duct, we put the guide wire, we are sure with it by looking at the guide wire that we are not in the PD with the CBD. Then only we inject a contrast once we have got an access. Without getting the access, you don't inject any contrast at all. Uh, at times, uh, the patient may come to you with a very flat papilla where you may not be able to cut it and uh, you may have to do a guide wire cannulation. Here we did a guide wire cannulation, as you saw. And even before we put this pinter from the guide wire was inside and uh, we could do that. But coming back to uh, some of the difficult cases where you want to do a uh, avoid papillotomy, you may make a small cut at 11 o'clock so that uh, when you do a papillotomy, your papillotomy is, doesn't make a very rough uh, dilatation and trauma to the, uh, to the papilla. Uh, I think we'll not go to the steps of the ERCP. I'll just go and uh, we go to the emergencies. Septic cholangitis is present is almost 19% of the patient with CPG stone. These all these patients they need endoscopic decompression immediately. Uh, even at times you may have to do a bedside uh, decompression. The most important thing is if the patient is really, really seriously ill, we should not try to remove the, the cal. This is one patient where uh, we wanted to just put a stand, nothing else, because he was having a separate cholangitis, where I had to do a pre-cut because the ampulla was not accessible. And you can see we have done a pre-cut with a needle knife and just put a stand without looking into the CBD, whether uh, we have just confirmed the CBD by passing a guide wire. Uh, Separate cholangitis may present like this. The moment you are inside the duodenum, you might see the frank pus coming out from the papilla. In this particular patient, we were lucky that the stone, uh, although, I, although as a caveat, I don't want to attend, but it just came out on its own, although it was very large and the patient is doing fine. Uh, this patient I operated uh, because there was this webinar only. Uh, I took up this patient who had deep obstructive jaundice. We, uh, we took him on the 2nd of June uh, and we could not proceed further because his papilla was very bad. We did a pre-cut and this is what say, do a pre-cut, go back after 48 hours. Then again, I, yesterday I went inside and you can see I'm injecting the air and air cholangi cholangiogram, no contrast being injected there. And you can see the thick uh, bile, dirty bile coming out. The first thing that you do in all these cases is take a bile for culture and thereafter, don't try to take out the cal, but is what, that's what we have done. And we are putting a, a stand over a guide wire. And, uh, and that's it. So separate cholangitis, try to do standing with the 448 hours, do not delay. Uh, in case you fail, 
then uh, you must have all the armamentarium, your intervention radiologists in some of our cases, our intervention radiology, they immediately do an anti-grade uh, stenting and take out the by PTBD. And then later on, you can always do an internalization in case of uh, malignancies where uh, you want a permanent stent. And even, even a metal stent can be put from by the intervention uh, get, uh, radiologist. Bleed compression by nasopharyngeal catheter in acute superior cholangitis. There are many studies, and most of the studies they say that if done within 24, 48 hours, it reduces the mortality uh, by by uh, quite uh, significant percentage. Large common by that stone, which cause obstruction, may be treated with a simple ERCP with with mechanical literacy. But today, as a, my standard uh, uh, treatment I, uh, or the stringent treatment standard recommended is cholangioscopy and uh, laser literacy if you have. Otherwise, you may be lucky to be able to do a good wide spinterotomy provided the papilla is very good. And if lifetime, per, if your luck permits, you may be able to take out a large cal also, uh, as, as is evident in this case. We never expected that we'll be able to just take it out with the help of a, uh, of a dormia basket. And uh, this was a large three centimeter obstructed cal in the cone bile duct. Uh, such cal you mostly get in cholidocal cysts and thus it just came out. Uh, patient again, uh, I did yesterday had an open surgery, post failed, failed lab, post failed open, ended up with a CBD cal and also a remnant of the GB. Now these patients are very tricky. Uh, he was not deeply jaundiced, so we went inside, did a balloon sphincteroplasty, and we have taken out the cal and uh, and uh, have it not put a stent even because uh, after the completion cholangiogram we did, it was quite clear, and he needs a uh, cholecystectomy again. Uh, this is yet another emergency which you will be getting. Uh, large CBD cals uh, plus the intrahepatic stones today are managed mostly by spy cholangioscopy. If time permits, I will just share some of the images and of the spy cholangioscopy. Intrahepatic stones, uh, usually there is an intrinsic disease which that needs to be treated like Carolis disease or recurrent pyogenic cholangitis, or there might be a portal biliopathy, which itself is a different subject and which might be present to you as a human. Here, endoscopy, the role is always there. You might need to stabilize the patient. If the patient is going for surgery, you may have to go for so, uh, refer him to surgeon or to yourself, in fact, for surgical resection. And if uh, that is not amenable percutaneously, the choridocoscopically, it can be drained. Uh, traumatic is the next common category of patient which come to us with an emergency, whether it's a blunt trauma or a trauma caused by the surgery in cholecystectomy, CBG exploration, or gastrectomy, or pancreatic surgery. Uh, they need, uh, depending on the stasing, uh, stays or the, as per the classification, uh, you can make, uh, make out A, B, C, or most of these patients can be uh, treated with the, by the endoscopist, except those having a uh, higher uh, type E or type E1, E2, or some those having a complete hilar cutoff where there might be little issues with that. Uh, this is one patient who was uh, came to us, has a, we, uh, you can see the contrast, I'm sorry for a uh, image, and then you can see the cyst duct, uh, the contrast is leaking. This patient need a simple endoscopic intervention, just put a guide wire and put a stand there. Yet another patient who is, just done yesterday, uh, day for yesterday, as a large stone and also a remnant GV here. Uh, here, so we have just gone in and uh, put our stent uh, and without uh, removing the the uh, the cal. The, the the patients coming with malignant obstructive jaundice uh, are usually malnourished. They are dehydrated. They are septic. They just need a temporary decompression. They don't need any uh, uh, in, major intervention. They need to be corrected. The different uh, for decompression, we have different types of stents: plastic stents like Teflon, urethane, mali, um, uh, and uh, dilating catheters, balloon for dilatations, and uh, these are the different types of stents which you can use depending on the uh, on the on the requirement of the patient.
uh, a simple stand in a league which I had showed is a simple step spin Amsterdam stand, or you can also use a pigtail stand. We prefer using a single pigtail stand to avoid upward migration. So this is one long stitcher in the patient post cholecystectomy ischemic stitcher where we have put a stand to, uh, pending further evaluation by the patient. Uh, SEMS can be, uh, they're very simple steps of putting a SEMS. You can see a stitcher there. This patient coming from Arunachal Pradesh had a stitcher in the upper at the junction of CSD and CBD for a surgery. Interestingly, this is a benign stitcher and we opted for a covered stand for this in a benign condition. And that's how uh, for the juniors, they can see how it, uh, the stand can be put nicely across the, across the, uh, the stitcher. Although it's a benign stitcher, uh, 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 but still you can put a stand and these stands, uh, although they seem to be permanent, but they can be removed. Now, these are the patients. Uh, this was one patient where three attempts at, uh, uh, at uh, ERCP uh, removal of this stand failed because the stand was left by him uh, for one and a half uh, year. So uh, I just thought that I will show you this. This is what the stand will come from hard after one and a half year. And I had to remove it with the help of my robotic surgery. Uh, Escariosis and other types of parasites, uh, including aconecosis, is uh, very common. What we used to do was this. We used to take it out with the help of a, either open surgery or uh, with a lab CBD exploration. But then uh, you're never sure. Today you have done tomorrow. Uh, the Another parasite, another Escaris lumbricotis may go in. And this is the classical picture of whatever patient we get. Uh, Escaris is almost endemic in Kash Kashmir, where Professor Kuro has presented a lot of work, and you can always go in, take out the Escaris with the basket, never try to touch with the snare because it, it tends to cut through. Escaris, you may also, uh, I think, uh, sometimes it is lost, and as it is in this patient, I had to do a pre-cut, I went inside, and the, and the, and the Escaris uh, was or the round mob was inside the converter, which I could see with the help of a spy camera only. So a spy grass may be of help. And later on, once I have visualized, it just came out on its own and we had to drag it out. Uh, the highlighted cyst may rupture into the convalid duct and you may have to take it out and flush it. And looking at the communication with the bile duct, you may have to uh, uh, put a stand uh, there. Uh, I'll just go because time won't burn. I think we have spoken about uh, the uh, balloon dilatation no here. No more, no more Okay, uh, last uh, few words about spicolangioscopy, which has come is a big way, uh, particularly both for stones and also for uh, malignancies where a breast cytology may give you only 50% uh, uh, positive positivity and with uh, at least uh, more than 50% patient undergoing surgery without being a proper diagnosis. So you can visualize the inside the convalid. You can visualize the hepatic no, no. duct. Uh, spy scope. That's how a normal duct looks like, and uh, and uh, you can always go in and uh, and uh, visualize the 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 hepatic ducts and take a biopsy from the actual lesion where you want to. A malignant looking lesion may come out to be benign, and a benign looking lesion might come out to be malignant because a breast cytology may not be enough uh, in such cases. For a spy cholangioscopy. Uh, what we do, we we initially nowadays we have started dilating because very easy for the spice scope to go in, and then uh, although it's a single operator, we need a uh, 30 or 20 watts laser, quantum laser, and then you before you go in, we have a, as you saw, we have already loaded the laser in the scope. Otherwise, sometimes it doesn't come out, and once you are inside with the laser, you can do a lithotripsy. Uh, I think uh, time won't permit to, for me to, let me just see. Uh, uh, one more use of spice hope is sometimes uh, you need to assist your uh, surgeon on the table when he's lost, he's not, he's confused uh, whether they, so, uh, 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 
So, take your camera uh, in through the CBD and can visualize the uh, the bone valve duct and check that uh, they do a little there. On table cholangioscopy. Video is not running, sorry. Uh, so with the help of laparoscope, also through the epigastric code, rather than the microscope or taking a, uh, any other rigid telescope, you can also go in. I think there is some connectivity issue with Professor Subhash Khanna. Let's just wait for a couple of seconds and see if he can connect back. Yeah, I think he lost his connection there. So I believe he was almost towards the fag end of his presentation. Uh, no, I am connected through the other system. Dr. Phalla, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, but we can't see your uh, slides. Sorry, my slides are, I'm not able to open it now. Uh, okay. So I'm just the other system. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, what I wanted to say in with conclusion, because I, I might have missed one or two videos were very interesting where we use endoscopy for both for in open surgery and also in um, robotic surgery and also in um, uh, different ways, uh, which I wanted to share, but somehow there was a problem in the other system. Uh, so what I want to say is an endoscopist has a role in all hepatopancreatic emergencies. It's a vast subject. It itself is a subject that needs to be looked into. We might have specialists only looking at endoscopy for hepatopancreatic tree. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Thank you. Okay, now the session, I will open the session for uh, Q&As and panel discussions. There are a couple of questions from the attendees, but before that, I would like to invite all our panelists for their comments or queries. Dr. Omar, Dr. Atul, and Dr. Satya Prakash, Satya Priya Desarka, you're all welcome. If you have any comments or queries regarding these talks, please Move go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a fantastic uh, discussion by my very good friend, started by Bipul Rai. I told you have covered everything, and with your magical performance for the last 30 yeah. years, you are uh, enriching the subcontinent and the global standard you have reached there, fantastic. I think he has mentioned everything. Uh, only I think that uh, for uh, putting a clip on Dewler Foyers there, uh, we can sometimes put a band also over the Dewler Foyers, if you feel. And uh, putting OT clip over the Ovisco clip is definitely a great uh, newer thing where even the full thickness perforation and other in good hands we can avoid the surgery and do these things. So everything he has shown and endoscopic ultrasound, what he has shown definitely something. Now the surgeons, newer generation should come and that his teaching should go for the endoscopic ultrasound also. That's all. Thank you, Satya. Uh, about uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Komolev, he has very nicely shown the indications for the lower GI, especially the anastomotic leakages are very important. And as he has shown, the malignant strictures are only a bridge to the surgery. You have to do within two weeks. But definitely the resuscitation of the patient's condition improves and the ultimate results also improve by that. Uh, so that's a fantastic thing. And anastomotic leakages are a very important thing. And if you can properly do, do that one that really avoids a very difficult surgeries. And you have shown so nicely with your pictures. I think that all the delegates will be benefited and will take up those things in the selected cases. 
and Shruvasta, you are the leader of my zone. Always follow you as my idol. So doing one after another, and now we are doing the hybrid, which I feel the main thing coming. We have to combine laparoscopy, robotic, endoscopy, everything together. And even maybe that this hybrid may come as a post-graduation or super specialty separate course, where people will go for hybrid things only. So that's a great start from your institution. And I, I really, I miss those things where the robotic and the uh, spyglass were combined. So we are looking forward to this. Thank you. I'll Thanks, everyone. And Dr. I'll Rana. share that video in the group later on. Sure. And we are really grateful to Dr. Bhalla for organizing such a fantastic international uh, endoscopy uh, seminar for the uh, uh, surgeons who will get extremely encouraged and go ahead with their new art things. Thank you. Thank you. My privilege, sir. My privilege to have all of you. Dr. Professor Omar Gunal, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, like, I would like to say uh, uh, or present my pleasure uh, to be with you uh, with this valuable uh, population and uh, I, I also would like to congratulate all three presenters uh, for their very valuable and didactic presentations and, uh, and uh, I okay. would like to ask uh, some questions and uh, especially uh, the first uh, uh, presenter uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yes, I did. Um, yes. uh, do you have any uh, argon beam? Uh, um, what? Are, do, do you use in your uh, emergencies yeah. or prefer argon beam uh, coagulations? And uh, especially uh, you <laughs> underline the casualty room measures and uh, especially the accessories. Uh, is is yeah. it for armamentarium? Can I? Argon beam. Have I, have I understood the question that <clears throat> do I use argon plasma coagulation for active bleed, correct? Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I want, to, I, want, I want to share with you, Professor, that uh, <clears throat> argon plasma coagulation is a, a technology which usually allows a very superficial burn of maybe one or two millimeter max depth. <clears throat> usually it is our experience that a major submucosal vessel or an artery uh, will require a little more deeper uh, coagulative energy. And therefore, uh, we use exclusively uh, argon plasma coagulation for uh, uh, a gave like syndrome or someone who has radiation induced proctitis or angiodysplastic lesion, which are very superficial. We don't need to go and burn it deeper. I prefer to use argon plasma coagulation in right colon because we know that the right colon is very thin walled. Cecum especially, you have to be extremely careful when you want to use a, a electro a surgical unit. So yes, argon plasma coagulation has a role in bleeding lesions, but there's more elective role as I would say, rather than an acute emergency role, because for emergency, you need a more stronger unipolar or bipolar coagulative device to arrest the bleeding. So mm -hmm. I think this has been my experience over two and a half decades of several uh, patients we have treated. So I restrict my APC use for elective, elective control of bleeders like angiodysplastic lesions, very seldom, very superficial ooze or bleed. Yes, you can use, mm -hmm. but predominantly for active bleeders, uh, I would use a combination of therapy as uh, our colleague from UK has mentioned uh, at least two modalities, uh, uh, um, injection or a thermal technique or a mechanical device like a clip. So this is what I would do. Thank you very much. Um, Sabella, I, uh, may I may I one more question to uh, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Komolofe and uh, hi, <laughs> thank you very much for your nice presentation again. And uh, Mr. Komolofe and uh, but do you, uh, uh, I, I really wonder your experience about the uh, stent dislodgements and uh, um, in what uh, percentage uh, do you encounter stent dislodgement? Is, was, uh, was there a problem for you? Because 
uh, especially in the oncology cases uh, in the colon, um, the, 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 that's a big problem for us, stent dislodgement, especially stent migration. And, uh, and in another word, and uh, 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 what is your uh, clinical practice, especially in neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy patients? Uh, do you prefer um, a bridge therapy, especially uh, before? Before before the new adjuvant chemo uh, chemo radiotherapy, especially in rectum or uh, rectal sigmoid cancers. Two. Unmute yourself, Doctor Conner. You're muted. Great. So I'll try and work through those questions, and if I haven't answered, just for my, just uh, we can circle back. So the first question, if I understood it, was about stent migration, Correct. which uh, which is a problem. If you if you look at the literature, most of them say that you'll get stent migration in about a quarter of patients, and it's actually a real problem. Um, and that's probably similar to our experience. Now, I have to confess that we don't, I mean, we, we stent, but we don't stent that many. But certainly, anecdotally, I would say that, yeah, that's about right. One in three, one in four, the stent will move. And that's why it's important that if you're using it as a bridge to surgery, that you do your operation quickly. Curiously, the guy that I presented, the second stent case that I presented was a guy who um, he had... He was seen, staged, began chemotherapy, then came in obstructed, and then we were, we were swithering what to do with him because he was literally in the middle of his chemotherapy cycles. And we thought we don't want to operate on him just now he's getting chemotherapy, and he's obstructed, he'd have to get a stoma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we said, let's try and stent on him. So we put the stent and then he had to we had to wait three up about three or four months before his operation finished his chemotherapy. So it can be done. But I do think that by and large, um, you want to try and operate on them soon because if you don't, uh, you will probably have a problem. With, you could have a problem with stent migration. I think of it as a bit like uh, Crohn's patients when they come in with a perforation, and you want to try and you want to try and convert what's a hot, acute situation to a, a warmer, less acute situation by giving them antibiotics. Give them, give them, get them, give them two or three weeks to get a bit better, then you can manage it a bit more electively. And also, there's a greater chance in that situation you'll be able to sell and um, join them up and avoid a stoma. But yeah, as a process, have a one of 25%, 30% will have migration problems. The one thing that I didn't mention in my talk for sake of time was palliative stents. Uh, and those are the ones that particularly can be difficult because the stents are in for a long time or as long as the patient's alive for. So those are the ones that are particularly prone to migrate. And the only thing for that is if you're a palliative patient, you, you need to warn them about it and be prepared to go in and re-stent or reinsert stents. In terms of your question about um, rectal cancers and neoadjuvant, I'm like, what was exactly was that what you want me to, to try and answer yeah, for you, uh, sir? The, uh, in our clinical practice, our radiotherapists, uh, 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 radiation oncologists, does yeah. not just us to use the... Uh, uh, the, uh, especially the uncovered stents in the uh, rectal sigmoid cancers uh, be, be pure, uh, as a bridge therapy in neoadjuvants because it, they get sticked or, uh, 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 after the radiation therapy. Yeah. After, so uh, what, what is your ideas on, on this topic? So, so again, I'll refer back to that previous guy. That the, the curious thing about that gentleman is that when he came to have his operation about four months, the stent was stuck. The bell was stuck. That whole area was like concrete, and yeah. partly from the chemo, and partly from the stent, and part, partly from the chronic persistent inflammation that he'd had with the stent inside you. So I think that's right. I think that what we tend to do, if a patient's obstructed, and we think we want to give them new adjuvants, chemo radiotherapy or radiotherapy, what we prefer to do is defunction them, um, uh, and that way you're diverting fecal stream away from that area. Then they can get the radiotherapy without any issues, and then you go ahead and do the operation. Because you are right, you you will you know you, you, the stent is pro-inflammatory, the radiation is pro-inflammatory. You end up trying to operate and remove kind of you know literally chisel through through concrete. So we, we tend not to use stents and sigmoids or rectums if they're getting neoadjuvant therapy. 
We would use it if for someone's been palliated and we have we don't want to operate on a, an, an old frail patient and give them a blast of radiotherapy, but that's for palliation. But for people who are going, going to have a curative procedure, we would tend not to use a stent. All right, okay. thank you very much. And thank so you, Dr. Yeah, yeah uh, Professor Gunal. Sabash, uh, uh, one, one, uh, one more question for the Sabash Kana. Is, is it possible? <laughs> uh, we, we just have we just have a couple of minutes left before we uh, run out of time. Right. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but I would at this moment I would also like to uh, bring in Doctor uh, Professor Atul Sajdev with us. Professor Sajdev. I'm, I'm here, but somehow there's something wrong with my video, but uh, we had a great interaction. I think all the three speakers were wonderful. They have covered most of the aspects. Uh, another indication, I mean, sometimes I use uh, APC for uh, post ventrotomy bleeding. So there is a superficial uh, bleed sometimes. So I do use uh, APC for that kind of a situation. And we've also had very interesting cases uh, of course, we had uh, a couple of uh, situations where uh, there were uh, complications related to episiotomy and there was a uh, vaginorectal fistula, so which also, of course, uh, presented acutely to us. There was also a transmigration of, uh, of uh, uh, intrauterine uh, contraceptive device where the thread actually started coming out uh, through the rectum. So there were certain complications which we encountered very interesting and we could manage them endoscopically. So I guess uh, it was a great session. Uh, thank you and congratulations to you, Dr. Balla. Thank you so much. Sir. Pleasure, sir. pleasure. Uh, thank you. I would like to apologize to everybody. We are almost out of time, so we'll have to wind up the session now. But uh, there are there are a couple of questions in the chat box also, so we'll try to individually answer them by email. And uh, I would like to personally thank all the speakers and panelists for taking time out on a Sunday afternoon or a evening, and and, uh, you know, enriching our knowledge about all these wonderful techniques and interventions which you have shown us. And before we wind up, uh, I'll just request Dr. Parth to make a few uh, announcements regarding the future uh, webinars. Parth. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Parth. I am a surgery <laughs> resident at uh, JJ Hospital, Mumbai. It gives me a pleasure to announce the third academic webinar on uh, tux endoscopy, the topic for which is uh, role of endoscopy in a chronic pancreatitis. The speakers, the, it will be held at the same time as today. And the speakers for the next uh, webinar uh, are Dr. M. Kanagavil, who will be speaking on the evidence for endotherapy for chronic pancreatitis. Dr. Amit Mahadev will be speaking on endotherapy for stone and stricture disease in chronic pancreatitis. And Dr. Ankit Dalal, on endotherapy for pancreatic collections and chronic pain in chronic pancreatitis. Uh, these uh, recordings, uh, the first uh, endoscopy recording and the current meeting uh, will be available to be, uh, for viewing on the TUGS Upper GI Surgeons uh, YouTube channel, the link of which I have already posted in the chat box of our current meeting. Uh, this was the first uh, meeting that was held, which has been uploaded. And the current meeting will also be uploaded in a couple of days. And uh, all the attendees will be rec receiving a certificate of attendance via email. Uh, we thank you all for uh, taking time on this Sunday. Uh, this is our TUGS endoscopy group. Uh, and uh, these are the QR codes are for the feedback form and to join the WhatsApp group where you will be continuing to, where you will continue to receive uh, updates uh, of TUGS endoscopy. Uh, back to you, doctor. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Bart. Uh, with this, we come to the end of the today's session. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and panelists on behalf of the Tugs Endoscopy team. And we look, to, uh, look forward to your uh, participation and your presence in our future webinars also. With that, uh, we'll wind up the session for today. Thank you once again. And uh, a good night to everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.